So this might be the last or one of the last uh, messages in our series on orthodoxy. So we've been countering the idea that orthodox Christianity is just the version of Christianity that won out and, and defeated competing versions that had just as much right to be heard as orthodoxy. Oh, it's the back door, that's what it is. Or, or the front door, after all that. We will get there. So, it's a... No, no, they're getting there. All right, so, so I've called this message the boundaries of the New Testament. And I'm, I'm sort of debating whether or not to have a part two next week, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not 100% sure. I may. We'll see how this one goes. All right, so the first thing I want to do is take a statement. This comes from the book, The Heresy of Orthodoxy, by Kostenberger and Kruger. I found out something uh, here recently. I was reading a blog by Michael Kruger, and he mentioned uh, that he was, uh, when he was a student, I'm not sure if he was an undergraduate or a graduate student, but he was in a, in a university, and he had this very articulate and uh, well-spoken a uh, professor who was teaching him things that he had never heard of about the Bible before. And he was, uh, dis he was um, you know, saying you know, a lot of things that just weren't true. And it turns out that that professor was Bart Ehrman. So he was a student of the man he is refuting in this book. So I, I found that quite interesting. Anyway, so here's what he says, and, he, and Ehrman is picking up on Bauer's theory. So the central tenet of Bauer's reconstruction of Christianity is that the reason one set of books wins and another does not has nothing to do with the characteristics of the books themselves or their historical connections to an apostle and certainly has nothing to do with any activity of God but is the result of a political power grab by the victorious party. That's basically the essence of what is taught about, uh, by these men about uh, the Bible. So what the orthodoxy that won is the one that they criticize. All right, so our method has been to work from the Bible outwards. So we talked about the core message of the Bible consistently centers on the doctrine of Jesus Christ. The authorized representatives of Jesus consistently preach that doctrine everywhere. We had several messages about Paul, showed how Paul said the same thing, whether he was old or young, whether he was in Jerusalem or elsewhere, and uh, whether he was in one book or another book and so forth. We, we also talked about uh, the Bible shapes its own orthodoxy, and the believing church receives its message. And last week, we talked about the idea that the Bible contains the embryo of the idea of an authorized list of the New Testament scriptures. So that's where we're going to start and build on that uh, in, in this message today. Now, the bauer Ehrman attack on orthodoxy makes some fatal assumption when it comes to which books won. They assume that the New Testament books and the extra-biblical books are indistinguishable in regard to their historical merits. So some of the ones that they'll mention, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Nicodemus, the Gospel of Barnabas, and several others, they're ones that they'll say, oh, these are competing, it shows that Christianity didn't have a unified message, blah, blah, this is their thing. They make no evaluative uh, judgment about the contents of, of the New Testament books versus these other books. When you compare these other books to the New Testament books, it's quite obvious that they are of an inferior quality. Anybody who is looking at them objectively can see that. And then they assume, they assume that God gave no means by which to identify his books. So they are working on assumptions because they don't want to accept what God's word says. That's really what it comes down to. So in all of this, there's an attempt to distract from really examining the merits of the books in question and a misrepresentation of the state of things in the early church with respect to the canon. The impression that they give is that the early church was kind of a free-for-all doctrinally, that there was just wildly different views of who Jesus was, what he meant, and so forth. And it really, it, it sort of staggers the imagination that you could have a, any kind of um, 
uh, system like that that is coherent in the world. That's not the way things work. You start with a basic system that is built, and then there are deviations off the system. You don't start with deviations and somehow come up with a system. It's just it's irrational in the extreme, but that is all they have to go with. So this week I want to talk about the boundaries of the New Testament canon. Does the Bible say anything about what books are in and out? Can we make reasonable and faithful claims about the process? So we're going to look at these two passages we considered uh, last time. We touched on them last time. I'm going to say a few more things about them. So 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And then 2 Peter 3.15 and 16, And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. And so we're going to be, I'm going to come back to these verses in just a bit, but first I want to give you the proposition. The questions of the canon are, can you see that? A little hard. Sorry about that. I'll have to change the font. Black and red don't work very well. The questions of the canon are minor questions about the edges of the canon, not major questions about competing canons. All right, so that's, I'm going to move it to orange there. You might be able to see it a little bit better in this slide. All right, so the first thing we want to talk about is an established core. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, I guess I should have had that 2 Timothy 3.16 passage uh, out because that's sort of what I'm thinking about in the first point in this, but we will. I think I do have it show up later on. Anyway, so the first, 2 Timothy 3.16, again, what does it say? It says, all Scripture, uh, and I should be in 3, not 4, all Scripture is inspired by God. All right, so that's the phrase that we're looking at. All Scripture is inspired by God. So when Paul says that, when he says all Scripture, what does he mean? What's he referring to? Does anybody have an idea what he might be referring to? When he says all Scripture is inspired by God, is profitable for uh, reproof, correction. Uh, I'm doing it wrong. Rebuke, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. So what, what Scripture is he talking about? The Old Testament for sure. They have their, these writing, other writings have been called scripture. He's called Luke's writing scripture. All right. So, uh, but for sure, this is what, uh, the for sure he means the Old Testament. All right now, he probably means, and I tend to think he means the New Testament as well. But for sure, he means the Old Testament. So this is the very first thing we want to talk about. The Old Testament was accepted wholesale by the Christian Church. And in fact, this is the, the, the Old Testament, the, the 39 books of the Old Testament, was established by the Jewish nation over 400 years before Christ. The last book that they accepted as inspired came from Malachi, or as one guy preaching said, that Italian prophet Malachi. Anyway, I've always remembered that. <laughs> okay. But anyway, that was in about 400 and. I forget, 50 or something like that, that Malachi wrote, maybe a little bit later than that. Okay, so the Jews had a very clear list of accepted books. The Christians came along and they didn't say, oh, we'll take this one and we'll take that one and we'll take that one. They took them all. And one of the very most dramatic passages about this in the New Testament is uh, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And, the, uh, and he, what Philip did is he illustrated the way the church used the Old Testament. Of course, you see the Old Testament throughout the New Testament writings. And the Old Testament writings uh, are, are quoted, they're alluded to, they're referred to, and they are held up as a standard by which New Testament ideas are judged. But anyway, with the Ethiopian eunuch, what was Paul, Philip doing? 
So while here's this Ethiopian eunuch, like, I'm not going to read the whole passage, uh, but you can look it up if you want later, Acts 8, verses 26 through 35. And so he, the Spirit brings him to this place where he runs across this guy, riding in a chariot, reading a Hebrew scroll. Now, we know which scroll he was reading because he quotes it. And I'm going to read that passage part of it to you. Verse 32 to 35. Now the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a, as a sheep to slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me of whom... Does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Who is this person who is led uh, as a sheep to the slaughter? It's obviously a person in this passage. Who is it? Who is being humiliated? Whose life is being removed? And so the Ethiopian man didn't understand. But what's very interesting is verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. So here's the thing. The Ethiopian is reading Isaiah 53. Remember last week in our communion, we talked about how the Lord Jesus himself said, I am the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. Right, that's amazing. I just can't get over that statement. I didn't even ever notice it before. Uh, and then Philip uses it to preach Jesus to the eunuch. So here's the thing about the Old Testament. This is the New Testament pattern. In, in, in You look at all the sermons in the book of Acts, except maybe the Acts 17 in, in uh, Athens. And you look at all of them, but they are appealing to the Old Testament scriptures. So that opening text, I, here we come with that verse. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable. Okay? Now, the old te- what this verse does at a bare minimum, like we've said, I think this applies to New Testament as well. But at a bare minimum, it means the Old Testament is scripture. All right? So there's no debate. There's no saying, oh, it's not part of the canon. No, we accept that. All right? And it says it's profitable. So what does that mean? It means that the Old Testament scriptures become the standard to judge all subsequent writings. If you get some writing that disagrees with the Old Testament, as some of those apocryphal gospels do, then out it goes. Right? It's not part of the canon. So God does give us a standard. Quote from uh, Kruger and Kostenberger. For example, any Gnostic version of the faith that suggests the God of the Old Testament was not the true God, but a demiurge, I'll explain that term in a minute, as in the case of the heretic Marcion, would have been deemed unorthodox on the basis of these Old Testament canonical books alone. All right, now, who, does anybody know what a demiurge is? Okay, all right. Now we have a little lesson, lesson in Greek philosophy. Okay, so the Greeks believed that matter was evil. Everything around them is evil. They see a broken creation. They see evil people. So, and they think there, there is a God who's very pure. But God is so pure, he could not have made this evil place. That's basically the idea. So how did God do this? Because obviously we didn't just happen. This is their idea. So God emanated. (laughs) So weird. God emanated from himself. It's not God, but it's sort sort of like next to God. Very holy, highly powerful spiritual being. And, but not God. It's this extra demiurge. So God is the urge. God has the, that means power, right? So a demiurge is a half power. But you see, that, that demiurge, the first one, that's too holy to create this evil universe. So in Gnosticism, they have, you know, they have like several layers. It's like an onion. You have the real God at the beginning, and then all of these demiurges are less and less 
holy. And then finally you get to the last one who creates this wicked world. That's their view. And that is taught in some of those Gnostic Gospels. Well, that's not the God of the Bible. Out it goes. It's not acceptable. So, another statement then, Gnosticism was a non-starter from the outset because it rejected the very book the earliest Christians recognized as authoritative, the Old Testament. That's from Ben Witherington. is quoted in our, in our book here. And that's absolutely correct. It's absolutely correct. All right. Now, um, now on the New Testament core, there's this ver verse back in Second Peter, and we see here uh, the uh, the mentioning of the list of Paul, the, also in all his letters, as uh, that un the unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures. We talked about that last time. So, what did the church consider to be? the New Testament core. Well, certainly Paul's letters. We also mentioned that Luke was called Scripture by Paul. And so what was at the very... Everyone accepted this in the early church. Everyone had the four Gospels. Everyone accepted the, uh, the, four, uh, the, thir the 13 letters of Paul. And there was uh, almost universal. There was a core group of books that everyone already... They were the very popular ones. They were the ones that all the churches copied. They wanted to get copies. They were the ones they considered authoritative. Now, uh, let's see here. Oh, I guess I didn't put this quote on the screen. So th this quote says about the four Gospels, although much is made of apocryphal Gospels in early Christianity, the fact of the matter is that no apocryphal Gospel was ever a serious contender for a spot in the New Testament canon. Right? So the Gospel of Barnabas, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of whoever. All right? They were never seriously considered. And also, these apocryphal books... Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Barnabas, whatever. They are second century books. They come much later than the four Gospels. And here's Irenaeus. Irenaeus is a church father writing in about 180, AD 180. And his reasoning is a bit fanciful, so just bear with him as we read what he says. It is not possible that the Gospels can be either more or fewer in number than they are. For, he says, since there are four zones of the world in which we live, and four principal winds, while the church is scattered throughout all the world, and the pillar and ground of the church is the gospel and the spirit of life, it is fitting that she should have four pillars, breathing out immortality on every side, and vivifying men afresh. Well, that's an interesting way of reasoning your way to it. Well, there's four corners of the earth, there's four winds, that must mean there's four gospels. Well, okay, so we don't, we're not, what I'm, the reason I bring up Irenaeus, I'm not saying, oh, Irenaeus, he, good point, Irenaeus. That's not what I'm saying. What the point of this is, is he is showing you what he thought were the authoritative Gospels, just the four. That's the point, okay? Now, kind of fanciful, they're, they're uh, you read some of the church fathers, they were, they were, their exegesis was not quite as good as it needed to be, so... Uh, you say, well, okay, those guys. Well, listen to some sermons. You know, go on the internet, listen to a few sermons. You'll find some other guys who are not quite as good at exegesis as they ought to be. Uh, and you'll find people who are better than me, by the way. So uh, I know that's shocking. But, but, <laughs> but here, so, so let's give, an, I'm trying to give Irenaeus some slack, is what I'm saying. Okay, so the big thing from his quote is, he saw only four Gospels. That's the point. This is at 180. Ehrman and Bauer are saying that in the 300s, when the church had their councils, they're the ones, and late in the 300s, it's not the Council of Nicaea, late in the 300s, they're the ones who, who set up the winning books. That's not the way it worked. They were already accepted, right? That's the idea. All right. And so, um, and then the epistles of Paul, all of the epistles of Paul, were a part of that core. They're certainly mentioned here in Second Peter uh, chapter 3. 
they are constantly used by all the church fathers as authorities. So the, how do we know that? Well, we're reading in their books, and we'll say, they'll say, as Paul said in this place. Or they might not even say, as Paul said. They'll just quote a section of Paul or a section of one of the other epistles, and they quote it as an authority, and that tells us we think this is an authority. Okay, so uh, they're constantly being used as authorities. Irenaeus explicitly affirms all of Paul's epistles, except perhaps Philemon. So you go through all of his writings, and you'll find him saying something about each one of them as an authority. There's an ancient document called the Muratonian Fragment. Muratorian Fragment, sorry. Muratorian Fragment. And they, it published a list of authoritative books, including all of Paul's epistles and others. But there is a statement, um, let's see... Uh, well, there's a quote here from, the, from Kruger and Kostenberger. In the, uh, in the Meritorian canon, they had accepted all of Paul's epistles. So the, here's the quote from Kruger. The implications of this historical scenario are clear. The vast majority of disagreements about the boundaries of the New Testament canon focus narrowly on only a handful of books. And we'll talk about them in just a minute. While the core of the New Testament was intact from, an, from a very early time period. Okay, so there's only a handful of the books that we have in our New Testament where there was any, not dispute, it wasn't really a dispute, but they were, they were just not included in some lists. And this is where I think I might come back to this with one other message showing you what that uh, quibbling was all about. So, uh, let's see. I think I have another quote here. Uh, it says this. What is really remarkable is that through the fringes of the New Testament, excuse me, though the fringes of the New Testament canon remain unsettled for centuries, a high degree of unanimity concerning the greater part of the New Testament was attained within the first two centuries among the very diverse and scattered congregations, not only throughout the Mediterranean world, but also over an area extending from Britain to Mesopotamia. So you go back through all these churches, even as far as Britain, as far east as the eastern part of uh, of the Roman Empire as you get up to the border of Persia, and you're going to find these churches consistently appealing to the basic New Testament core that we have. All right, so now let's talk about the books on the fringes. Okay, the books on the fringes. Which ones are they? Well, I think there might be one or two more, but it's Second Peter, Second and Third John, James, Jude, and some questions about Hebrews, depending on who you're asking. All right, so these are ones that there were. Uh, now they these they were all listed on some authoritative lists. So what do I mean by authoritative lists? I mean that in, church fathers would say these are the books we accept, and they'd say the four Gospels, and they'd say the writings of Paul, and they'd say maybe uh, Peter's two epistles. And then another one might say, John left us an epistle. And, and so, and, but they might not mention in their list 2nd and 3rd John. Or they might not mention James. Or they might leave off Hebrews. It's not that they're saying these ones aren't authoritative. They just weren't including them. That's, the, that's, the, um, where, that's why we say these are books on the fringes. They are not universally acknowledged in every list. That's the point that we're trying to make here. Now, there were some factors in this. One of the factors is geography. The books were written in different places, and so their distribution would take time to get from one place to another. And some of the books, obviously the writings of Paul were very popular. The Gospels were very popular. Acts was very popular. Those things would get around to the churches faster than the, some of the other less well-known epistles are. In fact, one of the reasons I'm, pre I'm preaching through First and Second Peter uh, in Wednesday nights is because we hardly ever look at First and Second Peter. It's in our Bible, but we just sort of, oh yeah, we spend our time in Paul. 
All right? That's sort of the way it goes. And that, one of my reasons for preaching it is we need to do the whole counsel of God. So here we are, First and Second Peter. And by the way, once we finish First Peter 5, then we're going to Second Peter. That's, that's the next step. All right, so anyhow, so the, the, these are some of the reasons why these lists are not as comprehensive as we could wish. And then there's this idea of the closing of the canon. Critics will claim, Bauer, Ehrman, others will claim, that the canon was left open until the mid-fourth century, so the 350s, 350s. Now, first, by no means was the canon a free-for-all before this period. In other words, you know, just depending on who you are, you pick the ones you want, you, don't, you leave off the ones you don't want. That's not the way it worked. And none of these so-called apocryphal disputed books were ever included. That, that's another part of it. But there's something from the Muratonian, Muratorian frag, fragment. Oh, I can't even say it. Okay, so, and this is a quote from, um, let's see, who is this one from? This is from Kostenberger and Kruger. This is what they're saying about the Muratorian fragment. We should not be surprised, therefore, by this very obvious but often overlooked fact. The very books eventually affirmed by early Christians are those which the majority of modern scholars would agree derive from the apostolic time period. And those books rejected by early Christians are the ones the majority of modern scholars agree are late and secondary. Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Barnabas. It appears that the early Christians were quite perceptive about... Uh, as to which books represented authentic Christianity and which did not. And, oh, that's not what I wanted to say. That doesn't make any sense at all. That's my conclusion. So let's go back. I thought I had this on the screen. So now I have to read what I have in my notes. And you have to remember, I'm raising the Muratorian fragment, couldn't say it, and now I read it wrong. Okay? So here's the quote. In the Muratorian fragment of the second century, the very popular Shepherd of Hermas is mentioned as a book that can be read by the church, but is rejected as canonical. Okay, so the fragment lists book it con books it considers authoritative, and it also lists the Shepherd of Hermas, a very sort of well-known secondary book. Okay. He said it's profitable to read it. The grounds for this rejection are due to the fact that it was written very recently in our own times. In other words, the author of the fragment reflects the conviction that early Christians were not willing to accept books written in the second century or later, but had restricted themselves to books from the apostolic period. Right? So in other words, the canon closed at the end of the first century when the Apostle John died. That's really when it closed. The church no longer accepted any books that came after that period of time. Uh, so the question was what to do with the books already written, not books newly written. Okay, So that brings me to my conclusion. Okay, and the conclusion is, I'll let you read the last sentence again, it appears that the early Christians were quite perceptive, after all, as to which books represented authentic Christianity and which did not. So this introduces us to the boundary of the uh, canon. I think we will probably come back to this next time uh, and deal with some additional information about it, and that will probably be our last message in this series. And hopefully I'll get my quotes straight. I probably should put everything on the screen and then I won't get myself messed up. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you again for the opportunity we have to study your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful students as we, uh, as we uh, understand what was happening with our Bible, with the doctrine of the faith, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and so forth. Lord, I pray that you help us not to be shaken by people who claim, make all kinds of wild claims about the Bible, that we would have a perfect faith in the book that you have given us. And not only that, that we would live it and preach it wherever we go. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>